Hey guys, Emily Waiwu here. A couple of announcements here before we start the show today. First, Nature Nate and I are going on a road show to America. We will be in Seattle in mid February at the AAAS Conference. That's the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. We'll be hosting a couple of live shows at the conference on the 15th and the 16th of February. So if you're in Seattle, come say hi. Spend Valentine's Day together. After that, we will head to Portland, San Francisco, and LA. Hit us up. We'll love to see you on the road. And if you would like to support our road trip, you can donate to our tip jar on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash waste not, why not? That's right, Emily. Donate to us on Patreon. Not only do you help us, you get your own exclusive bonus content. For example, later on in this episode, I'm going to be talking with Irene Hoffmeyer, a queen of plastic pollution who made her own NGO in Peru that might have changed a law. We couldn't fit everything in, but if you want to hear the full thing, become a Patreon today to hear all that bonus content. You can follow our trip updates on Twitter at WasteNotPod. All right, on to the episode. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nature Nate, and this is Waste Not, Why Not, a podcast on how not to save the environment. I'm an environmental researcher based in Taiwan, and I've spent most of my career working on ocean plastic pollution. This episode is about ocean trash. And the single biggest, most hyped up, and most talked about solution to ocean plastics pollution. It's called the ocean cleanup. Not a verb, not a proverb like waste not, why not? The ocean cleanup is an NGO. Today, they're a $35 million nonprofit organization. In this episode, we clean up this change coming. The ocean cleanup. This change coming. Once upon a time, people only really worried about trash on the beach. And then the Great Pacific Garbage Patch was discovered. People began to worry about this mass of plastic garbage floating in the center of the ocean. And then, around eight years ago, a young man named Boyan Slat gave a TEDx talk where he pitched creating a machine that would be powered by itself, autonomous, and float in the ocean, collecting all of that plastic pollution and removing it from the sea. Now, I know you really want to understand how these ocean cleanup machines work, but before we get to that, I think it's important to understand and explain Boyan Slat's inspiration for making these machines, his inspiration for making this $35 million NGO. What exactly is the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? Essentially, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is a hyper-dense soup of microplastics and other marine debris that accumulate in the center of the ocean in things called gyres. They trap this debris. And it's not just the Pacific Ocean. Every oceanic gyre has a garbage patch. All that plastic soup stretches down, and sometimes it goes all the way down to the ocean floor. Plastic pollution is a three-dimensional problem. Actually, you know what? It, it's more of a four-dimensional problem, meaning plastic in the ocean doesn't just stay there. Plankton, floating microorganisms, eat the plastic and absorb it. They are in turn eaten by fish, who then get eaten by whales and dolphins and birds and humans, and they bioaccumulate all of these plastic toxins up into the food web and expanding outwards back onto land, back into our bodies. Every year, 8 million tons of plastic enters the ocean. And as of this moment, there are already an estimated 150 million tons of plastic pollution in the ocean. Imagine the largest living mammal, the blue whale. Now multiply that blue whale by 53,000 times. That is the amount of plastic in our ocean. 
And if this trend continues, by the year 2050, we will have more plastics by weight than fish in our oceans. So from Boyan Slat's perspective, when he went scuba diving in Greece and he saw plastic pollution in the ocean and he heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, he wanted to make an organization that could build machines that would clean up ocean plastic in the high seas in these ungoverned spaces where no country is responsible. Their ultimate goal is to reduce marine plastic pollution by 90% by 2040. And in the meantime, they plan to remove 50% of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch in the next five years. To start this ocean cleanup adventure, Boyan Slat came up with designs to make these autonomous machines that would rotate within the gyres and passively collect up ocean plastic pollution. And he started a kickstarted crowdfunding campaign to try and raise money for a feasibility study and then to use that to raise money to eventually develop the full machines. It's 2018. Boyan Slat and the Ocean Cleanup have spent six years campaigning and fundraising and designing and redesigning this autonomous collection machine. And there they are, October, San Francisco, in the shadow of the Golden Gate Bridge, they are ready to launch their new ocean cleanup machine. It is a 2,000 foot long series of beams. It kind of looks like a big, long black worm trailing behind these boats as it leaves San Francisco Bay. When it gets out into the garbage patch, it will fold into a horseshoe U-shape Float and move with the currents in such a way that it will capture these plastic fragments on the booms. However, during a storm, a part of the boom broke off. The plastic that was being collected inside of that horseshoe shape was floating back out again into the ocean. So after that failure, they refine it, and then several months later, they come back with a new design where they add an underwater parachute element to stabilize it against the current, and they make it stronger to deal with the storm and wave activity, and they have another launch, and they bring it back out into the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And while they're working on this, they also started to work on ways to turn off the tap. In case you don't know, the majority of plastic pollution in the ocean comes from land, and the vast majority of that is gonna come from rivers. His next goal was to create the river cleanup, to create the river interceptor, which was a stationary conveyor belt that's solar powered, that has a boom that traps and feeds debris in the river into this collection device and then humans on land can come to this collection device and clean it out periodically. Similar to Mr. Trash Wheel, if you've listened to our previous episodes, but it's like if Mr. Trash Wheel went to a startup accelerator. It's branded, it's sleek, it has a good design. They've set up these river interceptors in various cities in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, hmm, weird to mention that. We'll get back to that later. Now we're gonna check back in to the ocean cleanup. Last year, in 2019, they had finally collected garbage. Eight years of struggle, two years of launching, and they had never collected Pacific Garbage Patch trash before and brought it back to land with this autonomous collection machine until now. Triumphantly, Mr. Slat stands amongst his bags of trash on the Vancouver coastline city behind him, trash in front of him, cameras around him, and he pulls up pieces of garbage and big reveal, he's going to turn these pieces of garbage that's collected from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch into products. And the Ocean Cleanup is going to sell these recycled ocean plastic products to use that funding to pay for the Ocean Cleanup itself and to expand these systems all across the world. This is the completion of the ocean cleanup, a journey that began eight years ago, has finally reached its final destination, bringing the ocean cleanup trash to land and selling it to fund the ocean cleanup project. From a purely engineering perspective, the ocean cleanup is a massive achievement. Humans have not designed 
anything to really exist and function in the high seas. It's very inhospitable. Obviously, there's no structure to anchor to. There's no land below you. There's strong winds, there's strong waves, and there's just the normal intensity of the very violent Pacific Ocean. And they were able to create a freestanding structure that is not crushed and is not powered by motors or anything like that. But now that this journey is complete, we must ask ourselves, whether or not this is the best way to clean up the ocean. Let's go back and let's re-examine the ocean cleanup through a more critical lens and understand if this is truly a model that should be replicated and endorsed or one that we should reconsider. Let's go back. pieces of garbage that's been collected from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch into products. In general, you cannot use ocean plastic to make products. You can make a product, but it will be of very low quality. That plastic has been broken down by the sun and salt and worn down, and it's also very mixed up. You have many different types of plastic. The Ocean Cleanup has said that they will announce in September, later this year, what this ocean plastic product will be. You know, you can spend your money however you want, but to me this feels like a very strange product offering. You can give us $50 and you will get a random product made of ocean plastic pollution. And if your goal is to have products made of Great Pacific Garbage Patch, then this sounds like the ideal product for you. But if your goal is to reduce ocean plastic pollution or to prevent ocean biodiversity loss, there are some other products that you might want to consider purchasing, like this podcast. Let's keep going back on the ocean cleanups journey. Let's go back to Southeast Asia. They've set up these river interceptors in various cities in Southeast Asia. Remember how the ocean cleanup said that they changed direction to focus on turning off the tap, in their words. That was likely inspired by the research of Jenna Jambeck. And what she found is that the vast majority of ocean plastic pollution, at least in the Pacific garbage patch, is going to be coming from lower income countries that are also struggling to deal with populations in, in hard to develop areas. So if you really wanted to turn off the tap, you should look to waste management in Southeast Asia, in China, in India. It's because they don't have the infrastructure to recycle and deal with this trash. The root cause of plastic pollution, which is poor waste management systems. The ocean cleanup deployed two river interceptors, one in Jakarta, Indonesia, and then another in Malaysia. You are creating a river collection system, so you are not actually addressing the needs of these communities and the problems they're facing with waste on a daily basis. Being a $35 million company, perhaps they could do something to improve the livelihoods of the communities that their cleanup devices are adjacent to. To that end, later on in the show, we're going to talk with Irene Hoffmeyer, who has worked in Peru to develop an NGO that has actually done beach cleanups and changed legislation and changed corporate behavior to lead to a, a large level of awareness in Peru about the ocean plastic problem. Now let's go fully back. Let's go back to the ocean. Let's go back to the initial conception their ultimate goal is to reduce marine plastic pollution by 90% by 2040. They said that they wanted to solve ocean plastic pollution. This is fundamentally different from protecting ocean biodiversity, from stopping plastic pollution throughout its life cycle, throughout the plastics and petrochemical supply chain. Even if you were somehow successful in cleaning up the entire ocean of all the ocean plastic, you would still have carbon emissions from plastics. You would still have oil spills. You would have contamination from oil drilling. You would have cancer, very high cancer rates from petrochemical refining. 
Even if the ocean cleanup is successful, they would not be successful in protecting ocean biodiversity or human livelihoods that are impacted by the plastics industry. You might argue that it's not fair that this young guy is responsible for dealing with the entire plastic supply chain. That's why I'm happy to tell you that there are people who are as young as Boyan Slat who were working to deal with and stop the entire plastic supply chain by driving down demand, by decreasing the use of plastic products. Consider Irene Hoffmeyer, also known as Green Irene, only by me. She is the founder of a grassroots NGO based in Peru. Yes, Peru, that's right. We're going to South America now. Her organization is called Loop, Life Out of Plastic. When it comes to the ocean plastics problem, Irene gets it. She's had to convince businesses to care about plastic pollution. She's talked with legislators and the government, and her organization has done the difficult grassroots work of educating people on what a life is like out of plastic. Okay, and then it's worth comparing what Boyan Slat did in eight years and what Irene has done in eight years. For the ocean cleanup, for eight years, they built a prototype out of nothing, they crowdfunded it, they made a river interceptor, and now they are finally collecting trash from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. For Loop, for eight years, we've been able to mobilize over 10,000 individuals every year to be part of a legislation uh, that bans single-use bags to have put plastics on the national agenda in Peru. During Peru's transition to a plastics ban, Loop went to grocery stores to explain to shoppers why there aren't plastic bags and encouraging them to use reusable bags instead. This hadn't been easy. A couple of anecdotes of people coming up to the cashier and getting super angry that they're not getting their bag, and in some instances, leaving behind their full cart of purchases and being like, I'm gonna go shop at a different supermarket because you're not providing me with my basic right of having a plastic bag. Through initially crowdfunding and then later investors, the ocean cleanup has raised a total of $35 million, according to Crunchbase. Boyan Slat acknowledges that they are not solving the entire plastics pollution problem. But when you have $35 million, that's a lot of power in the ocean conservation NGO world. Irene understands the gravity of that kind of money. The Loop's been active for close to 10 years, and our total revenue is probably a tenth of one million. $100,000. That's all Irene had to mobilize 10,000 people and change national legislation. Imagine if Loop had $35 million. What would she do with that money? What would be Irene's solution to ocean plastic pollution? I wouldn't put it to just one single thing. I would go upstream. The core of the problem is linked to the petrochemical industry and when you're dealing with the petrochemical industry, you're also dealing with the oil and gas lobby. So I would put $35 million to build a competing lobby <laughs> to the oil and gas lobby <laughs> that can set up the alternative value chains that will compete with the current fossil-based plastics value chain. Yeah, I would also put some money into some end-of-life solutions, but much closer to land. Having a global waste management infrastructure that actually works, especially in developing countries, focus on, on redesigning our consumer culture. And I'm not talking about just bio alternatives, but radically rethink how we consume products. Some of this might be materials alternatives. I work a lot with startups now through, through my work and similar space as the ocean cleanup and also a Dutch organization. I think one that does good at this is, is the Great Bubble Barrier. The Great Bubble Barrier is a new startup that pumps air inside of rivers to oxygenate them and to isolate debris for easy collection. It doesn't actually impact wildlife at all, and in fact, it helps them instead. 
The Great Bubble Bearer is a great example of a tech solution uh, that also addresses the behavior change uh, that needs to happen and cooperates with trusted uh, civil society partners. I want to be very clear here. Neither Irene nor myself think that Boyan Slat, the individual, the engineer, the, the young inventor, is the problem with the ocean cleanup. What the ocean cleanup uh, probably was successful at was in bringing the problem to the tech community, maybe even the corporate community, and expanding the boundaries of people talking about plastic pollution. Irene empathizes with being a young NGO founder. It's not easy getting funding and sustaining your dream. I feel sorry for the guy. I think to have that liberty to do a, a gear change is, is a lot harder. And you have to remember that at this point, you might be the, the figurehead, but uh, there's a whole apparatus of people behind it, um, and especially these big corporations that have put money into the project. Who knows what might be going through the kid's head and what he might think of where the ocean cleanup is now and how much of it is, is his own doing and how much of it is uh, the people around him. You know, your golden ticket is to get a big corporation to buy up your technology or to buy up your solution. They, they can't make controversial statements because they, they're, at the end of the day, an industry-funded initiative. So it's a much broader sort of societal mindset change that we need to also develop, you know, startups and, and, and new businesses that are not drawn to that golden ticket and that are willing to, to be patient, to just be happy at their status of growth and, and to have a more maybe painful journey, uh, but stay truer to their core values. When you look at youth climate or youth environmental activists, what happens is you rely on people who've had more experience, who've tried things and failed, to show you the right way or to show you a better way to go. What happens when you're a young person, you present an idea and everyone agrees with you, you kind of get this like celebrity mentality. You're kind of like a child star and your growth in some way freezes because you have financial validation of your good idea. And where that financial validation comes from is important. The Ocean Cleanup has some interesting donors. You can find them inside their annual reports. One of the sponsors of the Ocean Cleanup is Sabic. And Sabic is basically a Saudi Arabian petrochemical company. So if a petrochemical company is donating to the ocean cleanup, that should make you ask some questions about the efficiency of their solution. On the one hand, you could argue that this is a company trying to be a good corporate actor and solve a real problem. Another way to look at this is that this is an industrial giant investing in solutions that will delay meaningful responses to plastic. The point is that the ocean cleanup is backed by heavy industry who often oppose plastic bans and oppose real systemic change, radical change that would allow us to rethink plastics production. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say no serious marine plastic pollution person believes in the ocean cleanup, at least in my conversations it's interesting to note that the Ocean Cleanup frequently talks about their quote-unquote haters and critics, but they do so in a way that is sort of in the startup culture where if you're a critic or a hater, you're just someone who doesn't believe in their idea and you just don't understand and you just don't see things the way they do. But the difference with the Ocean Cleanup is that the Ocean Cleanup is an NGO and the Ocean Cleanup is operating in a very well-understood ocean research space. We know where plastic pollution is coming from. There are people who, many people who've dedicated their lives to this, and they've given feedback and said that there were problems with the ocean cleanup. And in fact, all of this criticism comes from a place of love for the ocean, and it also comes from a place of personal failure. I've seen what hasn't worked for stopping marine plastic pollution. Based on my research and talking with many other experts, there are three things that would, if done at a very large macro scale, which is hard to do, would stop ocean plastic pollution. The first is a carbon tax. If we had to pay more for plastics, if plastics were not subsidized, 
then alternatives to single-use plastic could very easily compete. Right now, it's just too cheap to have a small plastic wrap cover your gummy bears. There's no way to beat that. The other element is to fund waste management infrastructure in the places that need it. You're not going to contribute to ocean plastic pollution if your garbage is collected. You're not going to be throwing litter into the river if you have a bin at the end of your street. And the last step is to redesign plastic and to redesign how we treat products in general. The thing that actually scales is change human behavior. I don't mean human behavior as in refusing a plastic bag. I mean human behavior as in restructuring a business model, restructuring an entire petrochemicals industry that expands from the military to shipping to agriculture, and to rethink the kinds of products we're using and their impacts not only on our health, but on the health of the planet. The paradox of the ocean cleanup and of many environmental initiatives is that the easier thing to do is actually extremely difficult. We are in a sense of crisis. We are considering renaming climate change the climate crisis, and many people already have. And when you're in a crisis, you have to prioritize things based on their importance, their triage. You have to go after the low-hanging fruit to achieve the most amount of benefits. If we know that the majority of plastic pollution entering the ocean is from low-income communities who live near bodies of water who need waste management collection, why don't we fund waste management collection? If we know that the problem is plastics production, why don't we stop making plastics? It sounds simple to just talk about changing human behavior, but this is a really dramatic, radical change that we need to dedicate as many resources to as possible. You suck the wind out of that momentum when you say, hey, nothing needs to change. We'll just clean it up. We'll just have a ocean cleanup. This is the opposite of triage. This is like someone coming in with a gunshot wound and you clip his toenails. Yeah, we'll need the toenails clipped someday, but the bullet is what's causing the bleeding right now. We as humans are very good at investing in and monetizing and developing engineering and technical solutions. But those are not the kind of solutions that are gonna give us the society that we want. We need radical change right now. This has been the Waste Not, Why Not podcast. I'm your host, Nature Nate. This episode was produced by Allison Chan, editing by Allison Chan and Thomas Lee, who is also our sound god. Production assistance from Yu Chen Lai. Emily Y. Wu is our executive producer. We recorded this at MyCoin, a Bitcoin exchange in Taipei, Taiwan. Thank you, David Green and Malcolm Johnson for, you know what you did. <laughs> <laughs>